What a terrific day we had uh, yesterday. Very full, very challenging, very affirming. I learned things, I was challenged. Uh, we were welcomed by the president of the university, Cardinal Worrell, uh, talked about civility, uh, talked about uh, Peter, the Holy Father is a source of our unity. Cardinal Supic gave a marvelous talk on dialogue, the American tradition of uh, uh, civil argument and Catholic social teaching, and then Archbishop Gomez anchored that in a specific reality of Los Angeles. Uh, he called us to be saints. I love the line, there are no single issue saints, and that applies to all of us. I mean, uh, then uh, we had mass with, and Cardinal World took that lesson from the letter of Peter that seemed so appropriate. I learned a lot from the pollster panel. Uh, our, our, uh, it's, it seems like our politics shapes our faith more than the other way around. But then I found it very encouraging that people go to church are more open, uh, at least some of us, uh, to racial justice, uh, welcome to immigrants. Uh, and then we had a remarkable uh, session where uh, Scott talked about our history. Uh, Sister Patty reminded us that racism is at the core of our history and it's still a part of who we are. Elise uh, made me feel old and uh, uh, unresponsive. Uh, and then uh, uh, Hassman reminded uh, us who we are and who we are becoming. Then we mm -hmm. had that great dialogue, a tremendous turnout at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a beautiful day. And we listened, we learned, we talked about fear. Uh, I thought uh, Archbishop uh, Gomez used the See, Judge, Act. Uh, that's probably what we're doing today. Yesterday we saw polarization. Today. We're going to use Catholic social teaching to make some assessment of where we are, and tomorrow we're going to act. And then, how many Catholic meetings have you been at where your chocolate fondue is on the, the menu? That was a great setting, and what an amazing panel, the range. Uh, Erica talked about her journey. Jim said uh, uh, the exercises begin with giving people benefit of the doubt, and then he shared a couple examples where people didn't. Uh, Michael talked about the tribal behavior here in Washington. Robbie talked about his work with Cornell West and dialogues with others, and frankly, uh, how tough it is to dialogue in some cases in the Catholic community. Ralph reminded us of the reality of racism in our work every day. Sister Simone shared her journey and how she was judged by people who had never met her. And Matsi talked about the wonderful opportunity uh, we have today. So today we turn a page to Catholic social teaching. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel. Christine Emba is on her way here. After we solve uh, polarization, we're going to work on Washington traffic. Uh, it, uh, it'll be easier to solve polarization. Joan Rosenauer is our moderator. Joan and I have worked at the Archdiocese of Washington at the USCCB. She was uh, a key leader of Catholic Relief Services and now is the executive director of uh, Jesuit Refugee Services. I think the first woman to hold that position. Uh, she is a tremendous leader in the social ministry of the church. She uh, is a great person to moderate this in that she has been working for her whole life on how Catholic social teaching brings us together. And so with that, I turn it over to Joan Rosenauer. Okay, thank you very much, John. Oh, and the prayer. Uh, Father John. I thought mentioning the prayer and Father John counted. Uh, I'm Irish. Uh, thank you, John. Just indulge me for a moment. I wanted just to share a, a reflection upon uh, one of the best moments of my life. As you know, about three years ago in September, Pope Francis came to Catholic Charities. There's a story behind that story. The story is, is that a woman who I was actually at a wedding after we walked the reception, began to see people on the streets who were hungry. She said, take care of that guy, take care of that guy. So my wallet began to empty as I keep handing out dollar bills to people who are in trouble. So let's do this more systematically. Let's try to feed people on the streets. So a program called St. Maria's Meals began. Uh, we do it 
three different places in the diocese every week. It's really a wonderful thing. If you ever had a chance to walk by 10th and G on a Wednesday night, you'll see 150 or so homeless people coming for a really good meal. And by the way, why the meal? Because people stay in our shelters. The district gives us a dollar eighty per night per person for food. That won't feed much. Uh, and so we help out with a really substantial meal. So when the Pope was looking for a place to come to, Cardinal Sutz haven't come to St. Maria's Meals. He'd been there himself. So the Pope is going to come. And before he comes, he goes to Congress, of course, one of the unprecedented times to speak to Congress. And he speaks about four great people of our country, Abraham Lincoln, you know, Thomas Morton, uh, Dorothy Day, and um, Mark Luther King, Jr. And, and those four were the, really the heart of his talk. Now, here's what makes it special to me is that he could have stayed there, couldn't he? You know, he's he, a special congressional Senate lunch, this beautiful celebration there. He was a great speech. Everybody loved him. What's he do? He leaves there and comes to the poorest of the poor in our city. He leaves there and says, I want to spend time with my friends, he says, my friends. He comes and spends time. And for about 45 minutes or so, he was able to really, I think, touch the hearts of so many. And to everyone he met who just warmed up to him, he simply said one thing. He said, please pray for me. Amazing. Please pray for me. Over and over again, please pray for me. So my privilege that they was introducing to so many people who are my friends who are homeless. So our prayer today speaks in reference to his talk in Congress, those four individuals, what he said about them, and a call for us to be the same. So let us pray. Or as we gather today, may the words of Pope Francis repeated here help us to carry on the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, a guardian of liberty who labored tirelessly that this nation under God might have a new birth of freedom. The spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. who taught us how to dream, dreams which lead to action, to, to, to participation, to commitment, dreams which awaken what is deepest and truest in the life of people. The spirit of Dorothy Day whose social activism, passion for justice, and the cause of the oppressed were inspired by the gospel. Her faith and example of the saints, and finally, the spirit of St. Thomas Merton, a source of spiritual inspiration and a guide for many people, and above all, a man of prayer, a thinker who challenged the certitudes of his time, opened new horizons for souls and for the church, a man of dialogue, a promoter of peace between people and regions. May Abraham... Dorothy, Martin, and Thomas inspire our reflections and actually this day. All, all this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. It's quite an honor uh, to be on this panel. As John said, we're, we're um, kind of transitioning from looking at the signs and causes and costs of polarization to really uh, exploring how our Catholic social tradition can provide an alternative to the divisive and dysfunctional debate that we see so much and um, that seems to be immobilizing us as a country and sometimes as a church. Uh, I was told that uh, when, when one person uh, saw the list of names on this panel, their reaction was, wow, they're smart. <laughs> and that's very true. I'm going to start by introducing them but I'm not going to be able to even go near uh, what get, doing justice to the, the experience that they bring and the insight that they bring. But I will try to uh, uh, introduce them uh, briefly, and then I'll get us started, and then I'll turn it over to the panel to each um, you know, kind of have a, have a first opening comment and then more discussion. And uh, then a little bit later, we'll open it up for discussion from the group. So to my right, to your le left, uh, Megan Clark is Associate Professor of Moral Theology at St. John's University in New York. She um, has many uh, 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 roles that I could list. She's a fellow at CUA. She's been an advisor to the USCCB Committee on Domestic Policy. She's a faculty expert for the Holy See's mission to the UN. She was a Fulbright scholar in Kenya and has done a great deal of field research in Eastern Africa, many parts of Eastern Africa. Uh, she's on the board of America Press. She's on the faculty advisory board of Catholic Relief Services. She's also published very wise, widely. Uh, of course, I can't list all of that, but I would lift up two uh, books. One is The Vision of Catholic Social Thought, The Virtue of Solidarity and the Practice of Human Rights, and then Public Theology and the Global Common Good, The Contra Contribution of David Hollenbach, whom we're honored to have with us here for these days. 
So I've known Megan for many years, and I am always challenged by her ideas and inspired by her commitment to both the ideas and the practice of Catholic social teaching, and I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Professor Robert George is a McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He's been a member of the President's Council on Bioethics. He served as a presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He has been chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He has written many articles, opinions, and essays that have appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post and Harvard Law Review and Yale Law Review. He's author, also authored and co-authored a number of books, including one called Clash of Orthodoxies, which seemed quite appropriate for our discussion today. Um, but I think one of the things that really stands out for me is something we heard about last night, that he really walks the walk. And he uh, is a, a key participant in what has been called a, an ideological odd couple. And that is his work teaching and lecturing with Cornell West. So he really has made a commitment to finding how we bridge the divisions and has done that very effectively. E.J. Dion. Is, uh, has a, a, a column twice weekly on politics in the Washington Post, and it's also syndicated in, I believe, 240 newspapers and publications around the country. He's a, a government professor at Georgetown University. He's a senior fellow in government studies at Brookings Institution. He's a frequent commentator on politics for NPR and MSNBC. And he's also the author of seven books. Uh, a couple of the most recent are Why the Right Went Wrong, uh, conservatism from Goldwater to the Tea Party and beyond. I get that right? Okay, good. Actually, and the new edition is from Goldwater to Trump and beyond. And beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Be interesting to see. And then another one called One Nation After Trump, a guide for the perplexed, the disillusioned, the desperate, and the not yet de de deported. So I think there could be some of us in the room here um, that fall into that category. He's always an insightful and candid observer. And the thing he said he most wanted me to lift up in his uh, introduction was that he is married to Mary Boyle. And he has three children. And they are the center of his life. I didn't add the last. But that's, <laughs> that's true. Thank you. It was implied. It was yeah, don't implied. get me started. It's dangerous. <laughs> And then finally, um, delighted that you could join us, Christine. Uh, this is Christine Emba. She writes about ideas. This is what her bio said on the Washington Post site. She writes about ideas for the Washington Post opinion section. Uh, before that, she was a Hilton Kramer Fellow in criticism at the New Criterion and a deputy editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit focusing on innovation and technology. She writes on a lot of ideas, everything from the Roxanne Barr uh, controversy, to birth rates, to public assistance policies, to the role of faith in public life. And she's not afraid to take on the most challenging issues in a fresh and in insightful way. Um, she, uh, I'm so always so impressed by her clarity and, and the kind of unique eye that she brings to these topics. So we're delighted to have all of you with us. I, I want to kind of set up the topic by sharing uh, two experiences I had when I was working with John at the USCCB. I had the chance within a very short period of time to speak at two conferences. One was primarily social justice leaders, and the other was primarily pro-life leaders. And at the social justice conference, somebody stood up and said, you know, I'm so tired of being accused of not caring about church teaching on the dignity of human life, that I, that I don't care about um, children in the womb, that I don't care about the issue of abortion because I focus my attention on issues of justice, peace, poverty, uh, et cetera. And, and that's not true. I do care, but I focus my time on these issue, issues of justice and peace. And then I went to the pro-life conference, and somebody stood up and said almost the exact opposite. It was really interesting. She said, I am so sick of the people in my parish, I'm the pro-life leader, the people in my parish accusing me of only caring about children in the womb and not caring about the poor. That's not true, even though I focus my attention on the traditional pro-life issue of abortion. And what struck me was that, number one, I think we have to acknowledge that there's some truth in both of those stereotypes. There are some social justice people who don't really care about children in the womb. And there are some pro-life people who think that any attention to other issues is an immoral distraction 
from the most important issue facing us, which is the one million uh, children, lives, uh, children whose lives are lost every year to abortion. But it is also the case, as we learned in the, in the slides yesterday, that there are a lot of people who do own our entire pro-life agenda, and yet we have these stereotypes and we have these divisions. So I think the challenge of addressing, trying to figure out how Catholic social thought can bring us together across the divides. How do we get past the stereotypes and really understand that how the thought brings us together and heals divisions is, is very complicated. It, uh, it, it's based in reality and it's also based in stereotypes and uh, assumptions. So I'd like to turn it over to the panelists and get started with the first question. And Megan, we'll start with you. What do you think are the key principles that can heal us what are the important principles that we can look at and how can they bring us together across our divides? Um, as, a, as a theologian, immediately, right, I shifted the question to, right, how can they bring us together? Um, and I think that part of what is often in the way is a couple of stereotypes about Catholic social teaching itself, right? So we often hear that it's naive, that it's not connected to reality, right? It, it's overly optimistic, right? This just isn't realistic, right? Yet if we go back to the beginning with Rerum Novarum in 1891, Leo XIII set out as our task, engaging the world as it really is. Not as we want it to be, not as our ideological kind of worldview would have it be, but as it really is, right? Nothing is so important, he says, as engaging the world as it is and then turning elsewhere for the ultimate solutions to the world's problems. Um, and I think that that's important to, to kind of remember that in any conversation about Catholic social teaching. And we did that a little bit looking at those slides yesterday and the data, right? But I would say that from the perspective of an ethicist, our starting point has to be, how do we engage the world as it is? By starting with listening, right? And not kind of listening as just this thing that happens, but as an ethical stance, as our starting point, as an ethical principle. And yes, this means listening and dialoguing with people of different political persuasions, but that's not where we start. For Catholic social teaching, our starting point isn't primarily about politics, it is about the preferential option for the poor. Our starting point always has to be listening at the margins, listening to those who are excluded, listening to who is not at any of the tables of power. Right? Only after we do that, only after we start there, can we move and start talking about, okay, now we can enter into a political conversation and listen to people with different political pers uh, positions and policy and all of that. But the difference between Catholics starting with Catholic social teaching and other calls for dialogue and po you know, within the American debate is that for Catholic social teaching, we always have to start by listening at the margins. Right, so that's the first thing I would set out. Now, we have a Jesuit pope, which means that we've been hearing a lot about discernment and conscience. And Francis emphasizes this um, for Ignatian reasons, but also this is really important for Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching as an ethical practice is only possible with individuals and communities of well-formed and informed consciences. The principles of Catholic social teaching help us to exercise our consciences and aim to live more fully human lives in more fully human communities. Right? So a few specific principles that help us do this, and then later we can talk more about any one or more of these. Right? And as will surprise no one in the room who knows me, right? the first principle I want to lift up is solidarity. This is our goal. It is both a principle and a virtue. This is who we are called to be. 
John Paul II referred to the virtue of solidarity as a firm and persevering commitment to the common good of all. Paul VI left no kind of unclear, you know, room for debate. He said there can be no progress toward the complete development of the human person without the simultaneous development of all humanity in the spirit of solidarity. Right? In Catholic theology, this is who we are called to be. For his first trip outside of Rome, Pope Francis chose the island of Lampedusa, and kind of some stories about that were brought up last night. Lampedusa is the entry point for refugees arriving from North Africa into, it, into from the Mediterranean. Standing among these North African refugees, Pope Francis pointed out this obvious fact. Quote, today in our, no one in our world feels responsible. We have lost a sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters. We have fallen into the hypocrisy of the priest and the Levite, whom Jesus describes in the parable of the Good Samaritan, because we have become used to the suffering of others. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't concern me. It's none of my business." End quote. Over and over, we will hear Pope Francis talk about how we run from the word solidarity, but that it's our word, right? This is who we're supposed to be. Right? How do we do that? Subsidiarity is a really helpful principle. It is an instrument. It's an instrumental principle that helps us navigate decision making and where that decision making should happen. Participation is the method we use to put this all into practice. Right? Francis talks about it a lot in his speech to the United Nations. In particular, he framed it all in terms of empowering those on the margins to be agents of their own destiny as what we are supposed to be trying to do in terms of justice. Right? These principles have the potential to bring us together because they remind us who we are and who we are called to be, and they focus our attention where it needs to be. And as we heard the data yesterday, and I'll close here because I know I'm out of time, the image of the field hospital is one that often comes to mind when we hear this data. Right? We see the brokenness in the world. Right? We are in a field hospital. We are broken. But I would also caution that we don't get lost there. We don't get trapped in the field hospital because it has some pretty serious limits as our frame of reference. We may be in a field hospital, but our gaze still has to be beyond, and our gaze still has to focus on to justice. How do we build more just structures? And I would propose that Catholic social teaching helps us do what Jesuit father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries urges, and that is make sure that in all of it, we're standing in the right place. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I want to begin by uh, reiterating something uh, that I said last night, saying it perhaps even more strongly, uh, and that is that Catholic social teaching is Catholic moral teaching, and Catholic moral teaching is Catholic social teaching. It's a mistake, a profound error, to suppose that there are these two separate things, Catholic moral teaching and Catholic social teaching. We've let that become acceptable. And we shouldn't. We should treat that as unacceptable. There's one unified, integrated teaching about how we as Catholics should live lives in this world and what we should promote for our fellow citizens as the life-giving way. We experience our current polarization in the culture as well as in the church so intensely these days that it's an understandable temptation to think, gosh, we've got to do something about it. We've got to do something about it now. Let's look to see if we can find a principle which will then be the thing around which we unite. Now, in itself, that's not a bad thing. But I think it probably gets the cart before the horse. We should be first focused on the question, what is true? And then let's unite around 
true principles because they're true. The truth is what we're after. And as Catholics, we believe that we know something about the truth, not the whole truth, but we know some deep and powerful truths. And they're truths that are taught to us by the church, including truths about how we should live our lives and how we should live our lives together. If we unite just to unite around a principle and we get a principle that isn't true, our unity will be pretty worthless and it won't last, but the most important thing is that it'll be worthless. Uniting around error is of no use. So we need to get at the truth and here we're blessed to know that the church is a teacher of truth. There are truths that we reliably can repair to because they are taught definitively by the church. That doesn't mean that there is no room for conversation and debate within the church about things, but there are some important things that are settled. And let me begin with what I believe is the most important, most foundational principle of Catholic teaching about how we should lead our lives and lead our lives together, and that is the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. That's the anchor. All Catholic social teaching, all Catholic teaching about how we should lead our lives is founded on that. Now, there are debatable questions about how that principle should be applied, but there are some questions that aren't debatable for those who truly affirm the principle, who understand what each of those words means, profound, inherent, and equal. It means, for example, that we must respect and protect the life of every human being from the earliest human being in the earliest embryonic stage all the way through to the frail elderly person who is approaching death. That we must respect and protect the life of the handicapped person, of the disabled person, of the cognitively impaired person, and treat that person's life as every bit the equal of the life of the greatest athlete or the most distinguished scientist, or the most beautiful fashion model or, or actress. It's hard for those of us who are human beings because we naturally rank people. And for some purposes, that's okay. It's okay to choose the best basketball player for the team. It's okay to feature the prettiest fashion model. It's okay to award tenure based on the quality of research in a, in a university. But when it comes to fundamental questions of human dignity, and the protection of the law, no distinctions can be drawn. That means that if we are Catholics, we must be fervent pro-lifers, beginning with the precious life of the vulnerable child in the womb, non-negotiable. That means we must be fervent anti-racists, because to distinguish people invidiously to discriminate on the basis of some utterly irrelevant feature like race is fundamentally to violate the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. As Catholics, we must understand that all of us are brothers and sisters. There's nothing that changes that. It also means that we've got to stand up for the institution of marriage understood as the conjugal union of husband and wife, and for the principles of sexual morality that protect the institution of marriage. Sexual immorality always, in the end, undermines the culture of marriage, always does. As Catholics, if we believe what the church teaches, we believe that her teaching about sex, no matter how controversial, no matter how derided it may be by the ambient culture, is love-affirming and life-giving when we ask people to live up to the requirements of chastity. Yes, in one way we're asking for sacrifice from ourselves and others, but much more deeply, we're inviting them on a path to freedom because we believe that the church teaches what it teaches, not as a punishment or not as a test, but precisely because it is life-giving and love-affirming. It means that we cannot ever succumb to the idea that we can close our hearts or our borders to migrants and refugees in need. 
we are a wealthy and powerful nation. We just are. And as the Bible teaches, as the church teaches, as Lincoln taught, as Washington taught, nations, as well as persons, are under judgment, which means to say they have obligations. And to those to whom much has been given, much is expected. A nation like ours has an obligation to those in the world who are suffering, to come to their assistance in their own lands, to open our hearts and our borders here. All of which is to say that it is very difficult politically to be a Catholic today. It's an understatement, the understatement of the century to say that neither party these days is a very comfortable home for Catholics. We can never accept some, what are now core, what have become core principles of our political parties. Now that doesn't mean that it's wrong to belong to one of the two political parties. Some of, uh, some of some good Catholics have decided they're opting out of this. They're going to join the Solidarity Party. They're, they're becoming political independents. But if you're in a party, it seems to me as a Catholic, you've got to work within your party as well as in the larger political and cultural environment for those principles for which we stand. And that can be very, very, very rough. You can take a lot of abuse. You can go to my Twitter feed. I get it from both sides. You, you can take an awful lot of abuse. Or go to Father Martin's Twitter feed. He gets it from both sides, too. You can take an awful lot of abuse from people for standing up for what we as Catholics believe are the fundamental core implications of that principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. But we've got to do it. We have no choice but to do it. Now, Joan's absolutely right that each of us has a distinct vocation. Some of us are called to refugee work. Some of us are called to work on behalf of the child in the womb. Some of us on behalf of marriage and the family. And, and, and some of us have none of those as a particular vocation. We're busy fulfilling our obligations in other areas with families and so forth and so on. But still, we can be candles, even within our small communities. That's where subsidiarity comes into play. Even within our small communities, we can be can what Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik calls candles, holding the flame aloft, even just in our in our book group, or even just in our faculty lounge, or even just uh, in, our, in our parish, holding the candle aloft for this comprehensive, seamless, truly seamless, pro-life, pro-family, pro-marriage, pro-poor, pro-immigrant, pro-racial justice mer a message that is the, uh, uh, the Catholic uh, message. Um, we cannot embrace expressive individualism or me generation liberalism. That's just out of bounds for Catholics. We cannot embrace ethno nationalism or whatever they're calling it these days, ethno populism or, or whatever it is. If it's got ethno in it, we're against it. <laughs> uh, we're a different kind of thing. Um, and we may not win. We may not win, but as the late, my beloved friend, the late Richard, miss him every day, my beloved late friend Richard John Newhouse would always remind me, and I needed the reminding, especially when I was young, it's not up to us to get the victory. That is God's job, and we should not put ourselves in God's place and try to do his job. That victory will come if it comes in his time and on his terms. Our job, he would always call me by both my names, Robbie George, our job, Robbie George, <laughs> is to be faithful. And when we stand up for the child in the womb, for the migrant, for the victim of racism, for marriage and the family, when we do that, we're being faithful. And I think we need to ally ourselves and be prepared to ally ourselves with anybody of any faith, and even those of no faith, who, as a matter of their faith or as a matter of natural law, are prepared to join us arm in arm in standing up for these principles. As, as Catholics, by definition, in the very word, we are not sectarians. We need to be open to working with Jews, Muslims, 
our evangelical Protestant brothers and sisters, our uh, uh, Latter-day Saints uh, uh, friends, uh, un unbelievers. The great Nat Hentoff, one of the heroes of the pro-life movement, and also a dear friend of mine, uh, classic progressive pro-lifer back when there were such things. Uh, he was an unbeliever, to his death was an unbeliever, on his deathbed, with so many of us praying for him. He was, he was, he, he was listening to Billie Holiday. He, was, he, he had his own priorities, but God was not, at least explicitly one of them, I can't help but think, but at some level, what, what, what Nat was hearing in Billie Holiday was God's, God's message. But we need to be prepared to work with anybody who will work with us to stand up for these principles. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Some great uh, food for thought. And now we'll turn to EJ for some additional insights. Well, I, I, first of all, I want to thank John Carr and all the organizers here. Anyone who says that John is insufficiently attentive to tradition should point out that he's still on AOL. So, <laughs> and I also was very happy to see my old pastor, Father Ensler here, Monsignor Ensler. I always love to tell the story. He knows this story that uh, we hope he's with us for another 50 years. But as many of you know, Father, uh, Monsignor Ensler is both has these two great virtues that come together. He is passionate about the poor and he is an awesome fundraiser. <laughs> and uh, the story is told that when Father Ensler dies, he gets to heaven, St. Peter looks at his printout and says, you know, sorry, Monsignor, but you gotta go the other way. And Monsignor says, you know, gee, I did all this work for the poor, but you know, he always sees an opportunity to do good, so he's sent to hell. And then three weeks later, they do this analysis of the computer system, and they realize they made a terrible mistake. So St. Peter gets on the phone, uh, call Satan and says, Satan, you've got to send Ensler back. Uh, you know, we made a terrible mistake. And Satan says, you sure? I really got to do that? And he says, yeah. You know. And Satan says, you know, it's such a shame. He's been down here two, three weeks. He's raised $300 million <laughs> to install an air conditioning system. <laughs> um, and so I love Father Ensler. Um, <laughs> And I also want to salute Joan. You know, the question is, how do the principles of Catholic social thought bring us together? CRS brings us together. Refugee work brings us together. The work of Catholic charities uh, brings us together. And we are grateful for that. I also want to salute this panel. Um, I don't know if you know this about Megan Clark, but when she was in high school, people asked her, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, I want to be a theologian. Now, how many high school students do you know who say, I want to be a theologian? She knew in, the word. I mean, most fairness, of them. Yeah. it was work on human rights. It was that I wanted to work on human rights. Well, that's good, but they, go to, they should go together. Theologian came later. And, you know, and she, her commitment, she said, uh, is uh, she likes Catholic Church mission and complexity. And when uh, Robbie George mentioned Father Newhouse, it reminded me that before he died, I got to tell my friend Mike Novak something, uh, which is that many of my views are views to which Father Richard and Mike persuaded me when they were young and on the left, which in many cases were views they now rejected. And so in a way, the whole riddle here is how do we reconcile Mike and Father Richard's lives uh, and figure out what that tells us about um, Catholic social thought. Robbie, um, I want to uh, confess. Um, I was on a panel with Robbie once, and I thought, Robbie and I have some disagreements, and I thought I was doing pretty well. And I had this quote from Robbie, and I quoted this quote, and guess what? It was from, an, it was an incomplete version of what Robbie had said. Uh, and there is a theological term for what Robbie did to me next. He took me to the cleaners. Um, I, I think that's in Thessalonians uh, somewhere. So confession is good for the soul. I acknowledge this, and I thank you for that lesson. And lastly, Christine, I am just so happy that she is now my colleague at the Washington Post. And she's made such an extraordinary contribution to the Post, and I am so grateful uh, for that. Um, I want to fight the premise of the conference a bit in certain respects, but I want to begin by noting that today is the anniversary of Bobby Kennedy's death, the, the shooting of Robert Kennedy. 
And in some ways, it occurred to me thinking about this, and I was, I, many of us who are of a certain age, I am sadly, I think, the oldest person on this panel. I now think wisdom is better than I used to think <laughs> it was. Um, that, you know, I was sitting there with my best friend in high school watching the returns from California. Um, and that event, for, for me, as for so many of us, just affected me uh, for my whole life. And in a way, I want to kind of redefine what we're talking about here um, in terms of Bobby Kennedy, because we look back, many of us, on Robert Kennedy, and that includes, by the way, people who supported Gene McCarthy. My namesake, E.J., stands for Eugene Joseph. Uh, and I think Father Enzer came to Washington to work for Gene McCarthy uh, way back then. Um, but I think what Robert Kennedy has been honored for um, is an ability to speak across the lines of class and race. He was defined by an ability uh, to speak to white working class people and African Americans at a time not unlike ours uh, when there was enormous conflict between uh, African Americans uh, and white working class people. Um, and it seems to me that before we even get to political polarization, and Sister Patty reminded of this, uh, us of this, and I salute Robbie for his work on race and racism, um, we need to deal with the polarization at that level. And I'm not entirely sure where, how Catholic social thought helps us in terms of Republican and Democrat, uh, but I sure think that Catholicism can help us a great deal uh, in terms of this polarization uh, by class and race. I want to fight a couple of premises here. Uh, one is on partisanship. Um, there are times, there are many ways in which partisanship uh, is a positive thing. Partisanship um, is a form of loyalty. Father Cleet and I were talking about the Chicago machine uh, earlier, uh, earlier, and um, you know, Saint Andrew Greeley would remind us of that if he were uh, here today. Um, and uh, my, my late dad, who also died in 1968, so I always say three great Americans died uh, in 1968. When I was very young, my dad, uh, who was a Republican, by the way, um, mistrusted independence. Uh, and he mistrusted the idea of being an independent because being independent kind of said you weren't really willing to go out front and say what you were committed to. Now, we know, as uh, lots of speakers at this conference have suggested, that there are ways in which both parties go crosswise uh, to the Catholic tradition. Um, but I don't think we should always uh, see partisanship as a negative. We need to try to distinguish between forms of partisanship that reflect principle and forms of partisanship uh, that become a kind of tribalism where we lose the capacity even to talk uh, to each other. Similarly, polarization. Um, there are times when we should be polarized. Uh, one of my personal interests is in the history of the 1850s, uh, which unfortunately is quite relevant to our moment. We know where the 1850s ended up in the 1860s. But when you look back on the 1850s, there were a lot of people preaching against polarization. They said, we shouldn't be polarized around slavery. Um, a lot of the roots of that anti-polarization rhetoric uh, were racist roots. They were people who said, well, slavery doesn't really matter. Let's talk about the tariff. Let's talk about internal improvements. Let's talk about all kinds of other things. Let's not be polarized. And I think historically, when we look back, some of the people we remember are the people who were willing to be on the polarizing side. So again, I want to qualify um, how we think of polarization um, and, and to suggest that, again, if polarization becomes a form of hatred toward those we disagree that makes us incapable of entering into arguments, that can be a problem. But there are just times to oppose and times uh, to stand up. And I think we can make a case uh, that this is one of those moments. I want to put out two thoughts here on how I think Catholic social thought can help us overcome the worst kinds of polarization and the worst kinds of partisanship. Um, I am a fan of Pope John Paul II's encyclical Centesima Sanus. Um, and I am a fan of it because it is very specific about the principles that Catholics should embrace uh, in assessing economic systems. Uh, and it is very clear about how various systems, socialist and capitalist and welfare state and liberal, uh, fail to live up to these criteria. But John Paul 
In this document, and I think that uh, the teachings from Benedict to Francis are very consistent uh, with this, um, did not choose to build an economic system from top uh, to bottom or bottom to top and declare that his creation was the one and only Catholic and Christian way. The Pope's principles rule out certain approaches, um, including dictatorships, extremely centralized command economies, capitalism without uh, uh, generous safety nets and strong safeguards, while leaving, leaving open a broad area for debate and experimentation. Uh, to echo one of John's phrases, the Pope's approach was principled but not ideological, broadly egalitarian, and again, to uh, quote Robbie, it really did emphasize the profound, inherent, equal dignity uh, of uh, every person. Um, but it was uh, broadly egalitarian without demanding absolute equality. Uh, it was open to the advantages of markets, but was, always, was also very rigorous uh, in defending the positive uses of the state. Um, and I think Centesimus Annus lays out the parameters of the kind of debate that we could usefully have in the country right now. You can be a socialist or a social democrat or a welfare state or New Deal liberal as long as you accept that there are real limits on state power. You can be an enthusiastic capitalist as long as you accept generous social provision, especially for the poorest, approaches to work that empower uh, employees, and protections that allow parents to fulfill their responsibilities to their families uh, and communities. Um, John Paul, as well as Benedict, as well as Francis, are very alive to the ways in which our modern economy is inconsistent uh, with the way in which we ask and expect people to live their family lives. And I believe that should be a central issue that Catholics bring to the public square as well. What this approach means is that the right uh, cannot demonize the left as statist, at least if they abide by these principles, since the left in this vision understands the state's limits. And the left can't demonize the right as heartless because the right in this vision understands capitalism's limits and the obligations to the least among us. Um, the other thing I like about this vision, it is not utopian. Uh, it is realistic because it accepts that a free people will argue about ends and means and that there is no perfect social arrangement. We will always be adjusting in response to new problems, unanticipated failures, unintended consequences of our earlier actions. But if it is not utopia, this debate would be a whole lot better than the arguments we have now. Um, and I think those of us inside the Catholic tradition ought to try to model that kind of debate rather than the kind of debate we often have uh, with each other. Uh, my friend Ramesh Panuru uh, uh, was, um, uh, spoke at one of John's events. Ramesh and I were on a panel together. Ramesh, for those who don't know, is a uh, conservative writer for the National Review. When he first got to Washington, he always introduced himself by saying, I'm not Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, and Ramesh is a wonderful, thoughtful uh, conservative, and we've been, friend, we've been friends for a long time. And we were on a panel at the Catholic Health Association, and Ramesh said an absolutely wonderful thing. He said, in, you know, in our public life, the people who are meanest to each other are Christians. Uh, and that the kinds of fights we have, uh, partly because I, I am afraid we sort of draw on very high principles and we sometimes seem to think that anything we think has to be blessed by God because somehow we think we are godly, we can become very uncharitable uh, with each other. And I'm, you know, I'm a sinner in this respect too. That's why I confessed my sin against Robbie at the uh, beginning of this talk. Um, but it's sure something uh, that we ought to avoid. Last point I want to make. Um, I commend to everybody a, a wonderful exchange in Commonweal uh, this week on civic life. And I was really happy to meet Matthew Sipman today because I really admired his contribution. It was based on Bishop McElroy's uh, Bernadine lecture. And there were replies from Matt, from Kathy Cavani, and uh, from uh, John McGreevy of Notre Dame. Um, just a quote from uh, Bishop McElroy. He said, the Catholic political imagination must embrace the virtues of solidarity, compassion, integrity, hope, and peace building. Each of these dispositions of heart and soul relies primarily not on argument and analysis, 
but on uh, fundamental virtues of the human uh, spirit. Um, and I think we do need to rethink the way Catholics present uh, their, uh, their vision uh, to the world. And I think we need to rethink argument itself. Um, and I'll close by citing my, one of my very favorite um, takes on what argument is supposed to be like. I always talk to my students about this. The uh, late historian Christopher Lash, um, the author of a highly relevant book these days, The Culture of Narcissism, I should just note. Um, the historian Christopher Lash spoke of the lost art of argument. Um, and in real argument, Lash argued, we have to enter imaginatively into the ideas of our opponents. Um, and we may, this is a bit like David Hollenbach's uh, idea of intellectual solidarity, uh, by the way. We, we have to ima enter imaginatively into the ideas of our opponents. We may do so for the purpose of persuading them, but in the process, we put our own ideas at risk. Uh, and we don't have many arguments of that sort these days. And perhaps in the church, we ought to try to model that kind of argument. Following Dewey, Lash argues that it is only by subjecting our preferences and projects to the test of, the, of debate that we come to understand what we know and what we need to learn. And Lash concludes, uh, if we insist on argument as the essence of education, we will defend democracy not as the most efficient, but as the most educational form of government, one that extends the circle of debate as widely as possible and thus forces all citizens to articulate their views, to put their views at risk, and to cultivate the virtues of eloquence, clarity of thought, and expression, and sound judgment. Now, I mentioned my dad earlier. My dad and I spent uh, years arguing about politics. And we loved to argue about politics. My dad trained me for what I did for a living. Um, but we never stopped loving each other when we argued about politics. In fact, uh, we made a point of being very clear to each other that we were actually trying to kind of improve each other's game uh, at this and maybe, maybe perhaps teach uh, each other something. And I think that because Catholic social thought uh, encompasses within itself our complexity, uh, a search for balance between solidarity and subsidiarity, between community and the integrity of the individual person, between a respect for the role of government and a belief in the limits of the power of the state. I think that Catholic social thought and Catholic moral teaching can be, should be, especially conducive to the sort of argument that Lash recommends and that means, I think, that Catholic thought can be vitally useful to our democracy right now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, EJ. And let's move on to Christine um, and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me, I'd have to say. Thank you, John, for organizing this convening. It's um, an incredible event. Um, I think I'll keep my comments short, um, noting that as the last person to introduce themselves, it's inevitable that uh, many of my points have been made <laughs> um, more eloquently uh, by my fellow panelists, for which I thank them and also grimace. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I have to admit that I, I'm always a little bit surprised and delighted to be invited to these sorts of events because I still consider myself uh, a comparatively new Catholic. Um, I'm a convert. I converted less than 10 years ago, which both seems, now that I mention it, very long, um, but also very short. Um, but even so, uh, as I become more familiar with the church and its teachings, I find that Catholic social teaching um, is one of the great gifts of the church. Um, it's instruction for life. It is both sort of moral and you know, instructional and active way of living. Um, and I think just going back to our basic question, how social, Catholic social teaching can bring us together, um, is an important one for just conceiving of the project itself. You know, while it's always been around, I've noticed and been glad to see that it seems to be gaining more attention and consideration in our modern age, and especially, I think, um, among younger people and people of my age. Um, and it's clear that we need it more than ever. 
both because, as someone said, it is, it is Catholic. Um, it is accessible and relatable to, I think, almost anyone of, I think, what Professor George would call uh, of goodwill. One thing that I find to be true and delightful about Catholic social teaching is how clear and relevant it is to people who approach the world in extremely different ways. Um, and EJ touched on this uh, just before. It has much to say to different groups, whether religious or non-religious, whether Catholic or of a different faith. Um, socialists and Marxists, I think, can come together and attest to you know, the need for a preferential option for the poor. Um, Free marketeers, I think, can agree with um, socialists and Marxists in finding dignity in work um, and a need to respect uh, the individual will. And I think that we, we know in, inherently that all of these principles, confined as they are under the sort of large banner of Catholic social teaching, have to fit together and they have to rely upon each other. They can't be taken apart. You can't have one piece without the rest of them. Um, and if they rely on each other, I think that means that we must do so as well uh, as Catholics who believe in this faith, who believe in these teachings, who believe that this all fits together uh, and works towards a larger good. And to that end, the idea of coming together, relying on something together, um, bringing two sides together and ending polarization or partisanship, uh, I've been thinking quite a lot about the principle of subsidiarity, um, and subsidiarity of an almost non-political kind. So when we think about subsidiarity in Catholic social teaching, um, you know, it says that social and political issues should be sort of devolved. They should be dealt with um, at the lowest possible level, closest to the ground. Um, and I think it's our duty as individuals in society um, to take Catholic social teaching into our own hands. Uh, to devolve these larger principles into something that we each deal with. And that means that we have to deal with each other as individuals at the lowest possible level. You know, we can talk about structural problems, structural issues, uh, political cases. What is immigration? How do we deal with racism? What is justice writ large for the lives of the unborn? And those are big questions. And we can come up with answers to those. We can make suggestions. But we also realize, and we see, I think, time and time again uh, through different social movements, that things don't change. The law doesn't change. The structures don't change unless the people, the individuals living under those laws, believe that they should change and are willing individually to stand up for those changes. But to get other people who may disagree with us on methods or morals or teaching to believe that those things should change, believe in the beauty of Catholic social teaching, the beauty of the principle of the dignity of every human, for instance, we have to convince them. And you convince people, you talk to people by being face to face, by being in the trenches with them. Um, we've heard about allyship with people who may or may not be Catholic, who may or may not be on our side of the aisle. Um, we've talked about engaging in argument, real argument, the sort of argument that you know, assumes the goodwill of the other person and, yes, tries to inhabit their feelings and beliefs. And that sort of subsidiarity, that engaging on that lowest, smallest, closest level with each other is, I think, what we need um, and is an overlooked perhaps not overlooked, but an often um, differently defined part of Catholic social teaching that we can bring to bear on our individual lives today uh, to begin to close these gaps that we are seeing widen um, every day. Uh, and I think that that is something that we want to think about going forward, not just you know, the huge principles, the grand declarations of what we believe, but also how we live those individually with each other in community, in society, um, under one nation, and hopefully with love for each other. We are, um, the good news is we're gonna extend this a little bit beyond what's in the, the uh, uh, program so that we can uh, engage in conversation with the audience. So start thinking about what questions or comments you'd like to make. But I'd like to um, invite each of the panel members to 
you know, kind of reflect back on some of the key points that have been made, if there's anything that stood out uh, for you and what was said. And, and um, to, to think about, I mean, I was struck um, when you said, Robbie, that, uh, you know, we have to remember to leave the victory to God, which I would very much agree with. But on the other hand, I've always been drawn to something that I understand Theodore Hesburgh, apologies to Georgetown, um, used to say at, uh, at Notre Dame, which was that mediocrity is no way to serve the Blessed Mother. <laughs> that we actually have to figure out how to be effective, that that's what God calls us to while we're here, even though we should not have the hubris to think that it's all up to us. And so I'd like to ask each of you to think about some of the, some of the practical implications of either suggestions that other panelists have made or, or uh, that uh, additional suggestions you'd like to make about practically how do we shape the debate within the church and the debate within our political uh, culture and the two parties. Um, so since I'm sitting next to Joan, um, I want to th thank everyone for their comments. I think, I think practically Christine's point is really important. And this is one of the things that Pope Francis is modeling for us on a regular basis, which is you always see him you see him very clearly being the Bishop of Rome, first of all, in terms of an actual commitment to the local church and the local community and who is it that is invisible within his community, right? And the outreach and the particular attention to homelessness in Rome is a, very, is a key example of that, right? And you see the, the consistency of right, calling on parishes and convents and monasteries in Europe to take in Syrian refugee families and two families right, come to the Vatican. Why two? Because there are two parishes um, within the Vatican city limits. This kind of, if we're going to talk about what should be up here, we have to actually live it in our personal encounters and the personal communities that we have. Um, the thing that I think we need to model, and that's different, and, and where um, on one level I, I kind of agree that, that truth is really important, but on the other, as the theologian, I want to push and say we always have to remember that truth is most fully understood for Catholic theology as I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So truth is fundamentally personal before it is a, you know, kind of any sort of idea that we're looking for. And that's where I think what Christine pointed to, but also what Pope Francis is modeling, is where do we find the truth is really about where do we find Christ, right? And, and so again, I think it is where we find Christ is, is in where is the dignity of the human person being ignored. Um, because that is where we find Christ in our midst. That's where we'll encounter Christ. Um, and then, in engaging the, that, then we can start to talk about, well, what principles might be true and what kind of doctrines and all of those kinds of things. But I, I think a powerful thing about our tradition is that when we talk about truth, we're first and foremost, in a Catholic setting, talking about the incarnation, right? And talking about I am the way, the truth, and the life, and not about right and wrong, you know, who's right and who's wrong in that sense. Thank you. Others? I, I just, I guess, uh, at great risk, um, let me sort of suggest some of the things we are probably arguing about in our hearts here or in our heads as we talk. I think there really is a debate going on inside the church and that Pope Francis has encouraged this debate and pushed it along um, between a view that focuses on um, words like non-negotiables or inherent evil um, and uh, a return to Cardinal Bernadine's seamless garment, uh, which uh, put uh, abortion, put the life issue in a larger context uh, related to social justice and to care for the poor and to war and peace and to the death penalty and care for the immigrants and refugees. Um, and these are two very different approaches. And I think that there is a real argument going on among Catholics about which path is more promising. I've always been more sympathetic uh, to the seamless garment idea. And I think we lost something when that 
receded. And I think Pope Francis's pronouncement suggests that he thinks that too. That is the direction of his teaching. And I think it's one of the reasons why he's controversial among some uh, in uh, our church. Uh, the second thing, and this is really hard to say here, um, the Irish referendum, I think, requires us to do a lot of reflecting on what it means to be pro-life. Ireland is not the United States, uh, although we sure know there are a lot of ties to Ireland in this uh, room. But in fact, Ireland was one of the most Catholic countries uh, in the world. Uh, my uh, former, uh, the place of my ancestors, Quebec, was also one of the most Catholic places in the world. And indeed, some of the extreme backlash against the church in both Ireland and Quebec may reflect the very political power that the church exercised uh, in both places. Um, but I think we, we need an honest conversation of what it means to be pro-life in this environment and what is the best strategy. Is the best strategy to continue to demand that abortion be made illegal? Uh, or um, to, as in the Irish case, to keep abortion illegal? Uh, or should we be searching for ways uh, to make abortions, to reduce the number of abortions, to radically reduce the number of abortions, to create a culture that welcomes life? Um, and I think that our, we, may, we have to ask ourselves, is it a dead end to hold on to that old position focusing on legality, um, or are we better off changing the culture of the country to be welcoming uh, to life in a way that in the long run uh, would make the country far more amenable uh, to this position. Now, in the process of saying this, I, I think there is, I, I like to joke that the whole point of Catholic social thought is to make, and moral thought, I, that's a, I take your point, um, is to make everybody feel guilty about something, which probably proves I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, and that it is right that the church challenge the consciences of liberal Catholics on the life issues, and it is right that the church challenges the consciences of conservative Catholics on social justice issues. I think the corollary, corollary to that um, is that uh, those, we, we have a kind of obligation to defend each other, that those of us who are liberals have to point out to our liberal friends that we know a whole lot of pro-lifers who are passionately committed to justice, whose commitment to being pro-life is rooted in a commitment to justice and the inherent uh, equality of every uh, human. Um, and, but I also think, and I'll close with this, that uh, one of my uh, pastors, uh, Monsignor Tom Duffy, uh, at Blessed Sacrament Parish, once used Pro-Life Sunday to give an extraordinary sermon in which he talked about why it was important to understand why people were pro-choice. And he spoke with enormous compassion about pro-choice. He didn't, believe me, our parish was very mixed politically, so he didn't say anything that could be held against him. Uh, but he really asked us to understand the choices that people who chose to have abortions, mostly reluctantly, really faced, and why people saw a problem with this state making abortion illegal. And it was one of the most effective pro-life sermons I ever heard. So I think that on the abortion issue, we really do need to model the same kind of charity that we are calling for elsewhere. And I think that what happened in Ireland should make us reflect on where we should go and I've created a huge opening for Robbie to come into this conversation. <laughs> well, I was goes. getting worried, EJ, uh, when, uh, no, don't put those drugs away. I want to be able to blame it on the drugs. No, the quiz question, what do Tucker Carlson, Barack Obama, and I have in common? And the answer is we both love, all three of us love Nicorette gum. Oh, that may be the one thing that brings us together. <laughs> Well, when, when, uh, when I agreed with everything that uh, EJ said in his opening remarks, I was getting worried. Uh, uh, I wanted but, to make you feel better. <laughs> and you did. And you did by giving me two things to disagree, uh, to disagree with uh, profoundly. Uh, so let me take them uh, in order. I, I, th I think that the contrast you draw in that first point is just a false contrast. Um, uh, look at what the Pope says about the sanctity of human life and the life of the child in the womb. Nowhere does he ever relieve any state, any country, any jurisdiction of its obligation to provide the equal protection of laws for every member of the community, including the child in the womb. And uh, Cardinal Bernardine himself, before, before Hillary Clinton made the term deplorable famous, 
said that he deplored the use by some on the pro-choice side of the seamless garment effort to relieve people of the obligation to protect the life of the child in the womb. The seamless garment was never proposed as meaning uh, that we didn't need to provide legal protection. We could exclude one entire class of members of the human family from legal protection, so long as we took steps to incentivize, to the extent possible, other people so that they wouldn't kill them. That was never it. And uh, to his very great credit, Cardinal Bernardine, who was often falsely accused of uh, trying to, to uh, downplay the abortion issue, uh, to his very great credit, he made clear that 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 was not his intention uh, at all. Uh, his intention is one that uh, you and I ought very much to be able to agree about, and that is abortion is not the only issue, but the same principle, profound, inherent, and equal dignity, that causes us to care for the poor, to care for the victims of racial injustice, to care even for the justly uh, convicted death penalty uh, uh, convict. That same principle also requires our equal care uh, for the child in the womb. The late Eugene Genovese, your historian colleague, uh, and the colleague of Christopher Lash, with whom he had a wonderful uh, love-hate uh, relationship, uh, once told me, uh, uh, Genovese, uh, most of his life a Marxist before he returned to the Catholic faith of his youth very late in his life, the greatest historian of the American South and of American slavery. Uh, and when he was still in his Marxist phase, he to told the story of the way in which uh, pro-slavery people would argue uh, and, and really make things difficult for the anti-slavery people, that though slavery was certainly not in itself a positive good, the slaves themselves were better off having the American slave system because otherwise, chieftains and potentates in Africa who would sell the conquered uh, opponent tribe members when they defeated them to the slave traders would just kill them. The slaves are better off this way. If we destroy the slave system, if there's no international market in slaves, what that will mean is instead of capturing and enslaving people, the people will be, will be killed. But of course, if you think about it, it's a bad argument. Our law must protect all equally. There is no alternative that enables us, as the Dred Scott opinion tried to do in the slavery case, to ca carve out a whole class of members of the human family to say, well, they do not get the same protections of the law uh, that, uh, that the rest of us uh, get. So uh, I'm for the seamless garment, uh, actually, but the seamless garment has to protect the unborn as well as uh, everybody else and can't simply rely on in incentives. I think relying on incentives is also good. We should also create a culture that's welcoming uh, to life. And there are lots of ways in which we do not do that. I mean, there, there are lots of things about the system for which both the left and the right are responsible that give us a situation in which women who are in need and in trouble, especially poor women, uh, look to abortion as a quick solution uh, to a problem. Something's got to be done about that, but it's not an either or proposition. Now, as far as the Irish are concerned, <laughs> let the Irish not be our model. What we have in Ireland is a collapse into expressive individualism. There are reasons for this. There are reasons for this. Uh, well, okay, you can, you can contest it. You, you're, 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 you're perfectly entitled to contest it. But let's, we can look at a lot of factors in, uh, in Irish life. Uh, and some of those have to do with failures of the church. Some of those have to do with clericalism. Some of those have to do with the sex scandals for which churchmen and leaders are, uh, are responsible. But I do not think we can treat the Irish referendum as some human liberation story, that now Ireland is free because we can do what is done in other European countries to babies who are inconvenient or create a, uh, a problem. I, I think Ireland has gone the way of Iceland, and I just think that's a terrible tragedy. You, you can you can rebut. Could I, I don't want to. Can I just say two quick things? I don't want to have our our, our discussion yeah. of this dominate because I I basically offered that as something I think we need to think about seriously. Um, just on Gene Genovese, those of you who he was a he was a wonderful um, opinionated man, and I ran into Gene at a conference once, and there's a book of his I admired that I had lent to a friend, and. Um, I said, could you send it to me? I never got it back. And so I got it from Jean Genovese, and it was classic Genovese. He said to EJ, a lovely man 
who has fallen in with a den of liberal thieves. <laughs> Warmest wishes, Gene Genovese. So may, may his memory be, uh, uh, may we remember his memory. Um, the, uh, uh, just two quick points. Uh, point one is, the question I've asked for a long time is, given our certainty that there will be an enormous number of abortions if abortion is made illegal, we know this, uh, there are some statistics, I think they're contested, uh, we can argue about them, but an enormous number of abortions in the world are, take place in countries where abortion is illegal. Um, the question is, uh, what best serves the cause of life and what best serves our witness on behalf of life, making abortion illegal uh, or doing everything possible to reduce the number of abortions, knowing that making it illegal will simply not wipe out uh, abortion by any means. Uh, and we just, I think we have to take that seriously. And I, I completely take your point that uh, both, the, uh, both Pope Francis and Cardinal Bernadine were very clear in what they were saying. And they, you know, Cardinal Bernadine was not the relativist that some of his critics uh, accused him uh, of. Um, but if you put uh, so much of the church's political energy in a small number of baskets, and this is something Pope Francis has also said, you can lose an awful lot of energy on the other side. And I salute you for your work on racism. I salute you for what you said about immigrants and refugees. And I salute your attitude toward President Trump. Uh, and there are many areas in which we agree. I just think we need an open conversation about this, not from a perspective that suddenly says abortion is moral, but from a perspective that asks what is the best way to serve the cause of life. Um, but I, I'm, I'll promise, if, if Robbie says something else, I won't say another <laughs> word. I just well, I appreciate it. Oh, I want to make sure that Christine... Yeah, I want to hear what these writers. guys say. <laughs> the women on the and panel, by the way, audience, should so, yeah. fraternally correct both of us. Yeah. Or Please. I guess fraternally correct as and well. Then, and then we're just going to have <laughs> a couple word. of minutes for the audience. So um, quickly... Do you have a point? That you, you, you go first. I mean, we're not... <laughs> We're not here to debate the Irish referendum. Anyone who, who wants to know what I think can ask me after. I've lived in Ireland. I have m many friends and family there. So, But I can tell you if you didn't see it here, the tension, the t tension. So she has an opinion here, but Please. we may not be able to get to it. No, let's go to Christine. And then I do want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So. Sure. Well, I think um, just trying to jump back to the original question a little bit, um, what are practical points that we can take? Um, away from what we've discussed. And one of my, I think, odd qualities as an opinion columnist is that I really like to sort of walk the middle line and not put forth a clear opinion. I like to ask questions and have other people answer them. Um, and that's so, a blessing. I, uh, that's not what my editors would say. Um, but I, I think that there is a line in between what EJ and uh, Robbie are arguing about here. And this is a practical point that we can use in thinking about these questions. Um, one of the key points in Catholic social teaching, and one of the things that we hear repeated over and over again, even in this conversation, um, is an idea of dignity, um, of human dignity, of sort of defining what that looks like. Part of Catholic social teaching is really elucidating like different parts of dignity, what it looks like in work, what it looks like in family, what it looks like in society. And I'm not sure how we resolve the tension um, around abortion. Like it's really not clear whether the best path um, and perhaps the most holy path is to put all of our energy behind banning it or behind making society generally seem more pro-life. But I think one of the, the discussions that I frequently find myself having with friends, close friends who are you know, pro-choice is exactly the one that you mentioned your pastor had had. Why are they pro-choice? Um, and I think one of the questions, one of the answers behind that is a differing understanding of human dignity. And I think one of the things, one of the practical points that we can do as Catholics and as people living in the world, kind of as what I said before, uh, on an individual person to person level, is really begin to talk and teach and think about what dignity looks like and what best serves that dignity. So, and that is, I think, in natural law even, something that people can come to an agreement on, even if they come from very different points on the spectrum. Because what is a dignified way of life? For instance, in the question of abortion, I mean, what does care look like? Is it dignified? Is it really human that our society is one in which 
killing your unborn child is the obvious and reasonable option because you can't do anything else. Like, is that really a dignified way of being for women, that that is our only choice? And I think that almost anyone can agree that that is undignified, that is not what human life looks like, that's not what human life should look like. And from there, we can take steps to think of how to change that whether it's caring more for mothers, whether it's a stronger social safety net, whether it is outlawing abortion and making sure that there's something in its place that will allow these women to live dignified and human lives when they do have their child. And I think, I do think it is utopian in some ways, but I think talking about what life should look like, what we should be and how we get there is a first step that we need to take before coming up with the perfect solution uh, that will push through the legal system or not push through the legal system. Um, I think that's where we have to start. Good, thank you very much. I'd like to, okay, let's. What? Oh, I wanna hear my, the, the, No, the, I, I, I really want there to be questions from the audience. We've not been we're very much conversing out of time, enough. So. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Behind you. Thanks. So, in reflecting on yesterday's talks and listening to all of you today, uh, trying to identify what is the root of this polarization and what can we do about it. And I'm a family therapist, so I deal a lot with conflict. That's my life. Um, Help and, us. And one of the, well, and exactly one of the one of the constant challenges for in therapy is is getting caught up in the content rather than the process of the conflict. Uh, you know, I had a couple arguing vehemently after 30 years of marriage for six months about whether they should get a dog or not. It wasn't about the frigging dog. It was about the fact that it was, <laughs> they were empty nesters and the wife needed something to nurture and the, the husband wanted to be the apple of his wife's eye. And neither one could really have that conversation. What's the process conversation that's happening here? From my perspective, it's about functionalism. That the issue here is that so much Catholic social action or social action in general is rooted in functionalism and sentiment rather than personalism and an authentic Christian understanding of love. Mm. The idea that I have this group that I am passionate about, this people, these people that I feel compassionately toward, I wanna do something, damn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we don't connect that back to why are we doing this and, and how do we do it in a manner that's consistent in, 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 a, in a rooted in a Christian personalism an authentic Catholic vision of love. And I think that... Thank you. I, I'm going to have I'm, to ask you to get to I'm, the question. I'm getting the question. Because, yeah. So I think this is what Pope Benedict gets at and as Caritas says. So my question is, first of all, is there any... I'm checking my math. Is there any value in that idea of seeing this as a division in, in functionalism? And secondly, if that's true, what can be done to challenge conservatives to think through the logic of their... Of the extension of their logic and what can be done to help progressives make peace with the roots of their... Uh, the ideals. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask for another question um, right back here. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is Janae Isler. Um, I really appreciated uh, what was said about um, considering subsidiarity at the level of Catholic social teaching and uh, the relational aspect of that, the relational um, impetus for that, and considering that many American cities um, are more segregated than they've ever been along lines of class, which has direct connection to race and ethnicity, um, how, what are the, the practical implications and, and practical uh, ways of implementing uh, our Catholic social teaching that's not limited to charity, particularly along lines of class, but that really does honor and live into an understanding of uh, the equal dignity of, of all human beings. And also I wanna point out that also goes beyond argument and debate because I think that we do engage in that way quite often and we also engage in charity quite often. Um, but I think that there's room to grow and I'm curious if you have concrete examples of how Catholic social teaching instructs us uh, to um, deal with the very clear reality in our country of this segregation. Okay, shall I, uh, because we have so little time, I think I'll ask you to choose. Wonder, we, it's your turn. We've, we've spoken <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, in a sense, to both points, I, I think this is, why, this is why I started with, with listening, and I think it's not just about, I think we get too quickly to say, uh, to dialogue 
or even to saying, you know, let's sit around a table and have a meal and get to know each other, that sometimes what we need to do is actually learn something about the other person and the other community's reality before we even get in that position. And I think that's part of this, right, this, this push for encounter, this push um, to go out that we get from Pope Francis. Um, and and I, I think we can't underestimate that. Um, because even when it is well, listening for dialogue and engagement in dialogue, or let's bring together people from different backgrounds and get to know each other, it tends to be functional, right? It's so that we can do X. When in reality, part of the problem is we think we know what other people's lives are like, and we don't actually learn anything about the day-to-day -day reality. And, and that's not even enough, right? The historical context within which, how did we get where we are? Um, and that's, that's a problem, that's a push. Um, a, a very quickly, to, to kind of illustrate this, um, and I told Ralph McLeod this last night, right? I, I grew up in a very particular kind of context, which was um, a very um, educated Ignatian social justice family, right? So the question of white privilege, the question of the drive to be anti-racist, the question of, you know, taking whole, you know, Brian Massingill on his witness for what is it to be a, you know, a black man in America. He's, he's a famous theologian, for those who don't, haven't heard his name, you should all read his book on racial justice in the Catholic Church. Um, I, I believed all of these things to be true. But until I spent six months living in Nairobi, Kenya, I didn't really understand what it meant to constantly be being watched everywhere you went, walking down the street, to always be stand out, right? And yet, even in that case, I stood out, I was being watched. Any heightened risk to my person was because of privilege, because I was seen as someone who might have money, not because I was perceived as a threat, right? But that beginning to, that experience helped me begin to think about what is that historical reality of constantly having this anxiety of being watched and targeted. And, and I don't mean targeted for violence necessarily, but there's just no anonymity. That's the kind of thing. There was no, and here's what, you know, like there's no function to that. It was simply, right, learning and being able to then connect to what it was that I had learned about my own home context, right? So that's what I would put out and hopefully kind of gets to your question. I um, see Kim heading to the, to the podium. I think that's a signal for all of us. Um, I, I know there's so much more we could discuss and I'm sure that you uh, will wanna take advantage of any opportunity to get additional answers to those questions. I wanna thank our panel for a very lively and insightful discussion.